an artist. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a teacher, and that means, like a lot of artists, I have a lot of time poverty. So this is a place that I come to with every free second that I get. If I'm not making art, then I'm trying to fill my cup full of inspiration. So I don't really call this space a studio so much as it's just like this house of hustle. And that's why I put the pendant on the outside door. When I walk through these, you know, this door frame over here, it's on. And for me, I've realized that as long as I set certain conditions, I can be really productive in here. I try to do whatever I can to kind of call the muses. And for me, that means engaging all the different senses. I, I burn incense, I like to have espresso or coffee in here. I curate certain playlists depending on the painting that I'm making. And I feel like if I can kind of just line all those elements up, then, you know, I'm ready to rock and roll. I think people who choose to paint do so because it screams to get out of them, you know? And I'm, I'm like a receiver to these inspirations. And, and, and if my antenna is taking in all of these, all of these, you know, uh, ideas, at some point they have to transmit their way back out. And painting has been what I've chosen to do that because I feel like it, it's the best way to tell my stories. But additionally, I just love that place you go to when you're in the studio, you know, that that flow where where time stops, where where everything just becomes totally perfect. Well, you know, when I first started creating and exhibiting my work, everything fell under a very neat, concrete narrative. I was trying to tell a very specific story and I wanted everybody to know that one specific thing. Um, it was oftentimes very narrative or political in nature. But I realized somewhere along the way that I think it's much more satisfying for me when, when the viewer becomes part of that equation. I think of my favorite books or movies and it's when there's a certain amount of dissonance left at the end where they solve 70% of the equation, but they leave the, the remaining 30% for you to kind of figure out. And I wanted to find a way to bring that into my artwork as well. I didn't want things to be so concrete. I wanted there to be room um, for, for the viewer to kind of find their self in it as well. Um, and additionally, beyond that, I wanted to start creating work that would live well beyond me. Things that would make sense you know, 100 or 200, 400 years from now, just as much as they do now. And to do that, I think you have to ask the big questions. You're really dealing a lot in mythology and, and some of the answers and questions that are very difficult for us to, um, to think about. And it's difficult to come up with an image for those things. So I've started incorporating symbolism or these ciphers or clues within the work that I think give the viewer an idea of what it is that I'm dealing with in that particular painting. Um, for example, if you take my piece, Threshold, I think the second you see that there is this person whose skin has all of a sudden become blue and there's a floating circle behind them, you know as the viewer, that's your indication that you're no longer dealing in just realism. You've entered into another space. And all of these elements within the work have a very specific purpose. Um, so I don't really know how I would describe my work. I don't think it fits neatly in any lane at all. It's certainly figurative, um, but there's also elements of narrative, there's symbolism, it's portraiture in nature, I'm choosing specific people. I, I just think of the painting as, as me, you know, it's authentic, and, and I hope it's coming from a place um, that has a lot of legs left on it. I guess the big dream is to create something, you know, that outlives you, that that my my son and maybe his children could could go and visit. You know, I'd love to have something in a museum and and to be able to to create that piece that that echoes for generations.